Thank you very much, and um, I just wanted to be, really begin by, um, by uh, thanking the ACM and Alan Trum and colleagues for the very kind invitation to speak here today. Uh, this is a very important exhibition, I think, in the, the history of Indian trade textiles, uh, celebrating this very major acquisition by the museum and by Singapore, its premier collection of Indian trade cloth. I also want to mention uh, today we're missing one key person um, from this occasion, uh, Mary Hunt Kallenberg, uh, who was a, a key figure in the, the building of the Roger Hollander collection, uh, very sadly passed away last October. Uh, Mary contributed very much to this field, and I owe her a personal debt of gratitude uh, for sharing so much of her pioneering knowledge in this field uh, when I was starting out as a novice in the study of trade textiles some 20 years ago. With the acquisition of this collection, a ACM has really positioned itself as the natural successor, I can be so bold as to say this, uh, of the great historical entrepôts of Southeast Asia, of Srivijaya and more specifically Malacca. Um, and in my talk this morning, I really wanted to sketch some of that dynamic history, uh, which gives so many layers of meaning to the cloths you see upstairs in the exhibition. <clears throat> the story begins um, really quite a long way back. We have a remarkable um, inscription on the right-hand uh, screen um, of a stele erected by Tamil uh, merchants in Varus, west coast Sumatra, uh, 1088. It's inscribed and dated. It names the Merchant Guild, the trade organization um, responsible for erecting this memorial stone. Um, and it, it has uh, proclamations about the importance of trade and the necessity of the participants uh, to contribute to the uh, welfare fund of the, of the uh, trading union, really, for the benefit of, uh, of families and uh, widows and children and so on. Um, and specifically speaks of the activity of trade uh, as stepping on the, on the spread cloth, that, that to, to sit on cloth is to engage in trade. Uh, this is, in, 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 a, in a sense, uh, the the uh, symbolic way of repre representing uh, the notion of participating in a commercial dialogue by sitting together uh, on a floor covering and engaging in a commercial uh, dialogue. A very important inscription now in the National Museum in Jakarta. And on the left hand screen, um, a much older item, um, epigraphically dated to around the 3rd or early 4th century AD in the um, Tamil Brahmi uh, script, um, identifying itself as the touchstone of a goldsmith, uh, Paramal, his name is given, a Tamil name, um, and recovered uh, at Wat Klong near Krabi in the uh, Thai Peninsula. A very important piece of evidence that the uh, Indians, particularly the Tamilian uh, southern Indians, were very active in the region, um, not only sourcing gold, as we know very well, from a variety of early first millennium sources, but actually processing gold in the region as well, uh, actively in involved in in uh, goldsmithing and no doubt disseminating goldsmithing skills. And as many will be perfectly aware, India is the great uh, custodian of, of, of gold. Um, uh, India has displayed the capacity to soak up insatiable quantities of precious metals, uh, be it from the Roman Empire um, or from um, almost any other part of the world. And one of the key attractions um, to Indian merchants uh, in the early first millennium, as far as we can tell, was to source alluvial gold, particularly from Sumatra and, and Kalimantan. And so uh, the sourcing of that gold was a critical activity, um, the catalyst for much of the commercial dialogue that was going on with the region, um, so trade with Southeast Asia as opposed to simply passing through um, some nowhere land on the way to China, uh, which is how most of the early geographies both the early classical geographers and the early Arabic geographers describe uh, Southeast Asia. It's that place beyond China before India, sorry, beyond India before China. It has no identity of its own. It's simply a, a nowhere land somewhere in between the two. Uh, it's very clear uh, that in the Indian um, commercial mind, um, that was not the case, that this was a, a source of great wealth, uh, of natural products, of forest products, uh, as well as, uh, of course, gold, uh, um, your gold. So a very sort of critical um, beginning to the history. And uh, what do you trade? Uh, 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 to secure your gold, you, you give uh, you know, commodities which are themselves uh, rare and exotic. Uh, the commercial cultivation of cotton in Southeast Asia, we don't really know the antiquity of its history. Certainly cotton um, in China has a very late, is a very late innovation. Large-scale uh, large commercial cultivation really isn't a, 
in place until the, until the, until the uh, Northern Song and Southern Song periods, um, very limited production before that. Um, so clearly this was a major catalyst for trade with India, and, and um, India very early on uh, understood the importance of, of not only trading Muslims with Rome and the Mediterranean world, but also uh, uh, colour fast uh, cottons of, of, of high quality um, to uh, Southeast Asia, and indeed in uh, it's fairly clear into the ports of southern China. These don't become explicit in the Chinese sources really in, until the Song period, uh, but it, it must be a continuum of a process which began much, much earlier, but which the records are rather vague. <clears throat> the production of uh, t textiles is both very sophisticated and, and uh, very low-tech uh, at the same time. Um, this can be done almost anywhere, and you're the... Uh, the main street of your village and in um, Kanchipuram and Tamanad is a perfectly fine place to lay out your uh, the uh, the weft threads um, for, for, for your, your long cloth um, and the uh, dyeing and painting processes essentially of two of two types um, again the antiquity of the techniques uh, is not clear but we certainly have depictions of uh, Indian painting techniques uh, at Ajanta and the 5th and 6th century mural paintings in western India that show uh, would appear to show the use of um, uh, Masru and certainly Ikat uh, being produced, uh, painted resisted dyed uh, cloths, Kalankari, um, uh, Masru's in colour, the pens on the right hand screen uh, were being produced uh, both in western India on the and on the Coromandel uh, coast, eastern coast for a, for a very long period. Uh, the three real <coughs> production centres that, that will be the focus of much of the discussion in terms of the source of the textiles today are indeed um, northwestern India, uh, centred on Gujarat, which was the great um, trading centre uh, through Cambay uh, to West Asia, to Persian Gulf, Red Sea, the southeastern region of the Coromandel Coast, which extends <coughs> from the southern tip of Tamil Nadu right up to Andhra Pradesh, and indeed into the border borderlands of Orissa, and then of course the Bay of Beng the, uh, the Bay, uh, northern Bay, Bay of Bengal, uh, centred on the, on, on, the, on the Delta. Uh, region where modern day um, Calcutta is. Um, and the other great technique, of course, is block printing, and we know that this was in place. Um, uh, certainly, the, the earliest dated pieces we have from West Asian sites around 10th, 11th century, really are carbon dated, uh, reasonably reliably dated in this earlier period. Um, uh, but block printing was in place uh, relatively, relatively early alongside hand painting. <clears throat> and of course, the uh, catalyst for this trade, not only gold, but of course, particularly with the uh, uh, advent of uh, Europeans onto the scene, was the sourcing of old spices. Um, and I would recommend the work of um, a great scholar, a uh, Jewish scholar, Gotheim, who worked on the um, synagogue records from uh, the, uh, old, old Cairo, the city of Fostat, uh, 10th, 11th century mercantile records, re trading receipts, inventories of exchange, credit notices, these sorts of, of documents uh, which record um, spices which can only be um, uh, sourced in the Malaccas um, in eastern Indonesia, uh, showing up in trading exchanges in Palestine and Syria and up and down the eastern Mediterranean seaboard. So uh, uh, these, these uh, spices were, were, were circulating very, very widely in antiquity, uh, certainly from Roman, Roman times. Uh, not direct trading, of course, but a whole series of, of interconnected trading systems which, which tied uh, the region, as Alan said in his introduction, into a coherent um, trading zone. The Indian Ocean uh, region is, is a gateway to trade uh, in the whole, and, and, and instrumental uh, to, to the, the history of the region. I had to show you the Pepper Exchange in Cochin, uh, one of my favorite places. You walk past it, it's so aromatic, very wonderful. Um, but I want to quickly fast forward now to the, the, the Indian Ocean trading world of around 1500. Uh, this is the period um, where many of the earliest textiles in the exhibition and those known to us um, uh, uh, can be dated, uh, broadly speaking. Um, it's also the moment when the Europeans um, intrude into the Asian trading system, elbow their way in, the Portuguese were, were very uh, uh, effective and aggressive, the Dutch likewise. And, uh, making space for themselves um, in this trading system. Um, we know that the, the, uh, the Elizabethan England was uh, actively involved in state piracy, and um, this was uh, clearly state policy. 
I show you a very wonderful uh, terracotta from a, a Bengali um, a temple, uh, 16th century, um, which depicts a Portuguese Karak, um, contemporary uh, foreign intruder into the, uh, the world of, uh, of, of 16th century Bengal. So 1510, we have Alfonso de Albuquerque um, leading the Portuguese expedition, seizing Goa uh, and establishing a, a foothold on the west coast of India very, very rapidly establishing a whole chain of, of forts up and down the west and eastern coasts of, of, of India. Uh, remarkable how quickly they moved. Um, and this is a map from the late 17th century, from 1695, a Dutch map, and shows all the forts written in red, um, forts of, um, and trading centers, both Portuguese and Dutch by this time. And you can see the density of, of the, these uh, sites along the coast, which were providing uh, trading centers and gathering points, what they called factories, uh, for commissioning um, the production of textiles and other commodities sourced from the hinterland. A very important uh, trading, trading system. Elbogo uh, didn't hang about, but within, within a very short time, uh, by 1514, he had um, identified Malacca as a key uh, link in the chain of trade um, to, to the east. Uh, but also a great prize in its own right, and a great commercial potential uh, was its access to the East Indian spice, Indonesian spice trade, um, conquered Malacca uh, from the Sultanate uh, and established a strong Portuguese presence there. And this is really when the, uh, the records start to kick in. We have very detailed uh, descriptions from the beginnings of the 16th century. Um, Habakoko also sent ambassadors to the Siamese court um, within two years of arriving uh, in, in, in Malacca to, to Rama Tibodi, uh, the then ruler of Ayutthaya, so establishing a very important network. Uh, this uh, trading system that, that, that uh, he established um, allowed the, the, a trading system which extended from the headquarters in Goa um, to, to um, Peninsula Southeast Asia and then um, indeed to Macau and eventually on to, to, to Japan. Um, Malacca itself had an enormous role to play it as an as a, a entrepot in this trading system. And of course the other great sort of unifying factor in all of this was, was, was language and, and the emergence of Malay as the lingua franca, of the, not only the archipelago, but really the language of, of international commerce, uh, which really provided an enormously uh, unifying um, role and uh, placed uh, uh, the Malay world at the center of that trading, trading system. <coughs> Uh, the Portuguese presence in Malacca is, is documented in a remarkable way. Um, uh, Tomé Pérez published his account of, of, of his residence there for three years. He was an accountant, a bookkeeper with uh, the Portuguese mission, um, but a great observer of daily life and um, provided enormously informative commercial information about uh, the life in Malacca uh, in the 1512-1515. Uh, he makes it very clear that the key um, uh, Participants in the trade were the Gujaratis, and we have uh, <coughs> Babosa also writing on, the, on the, the role of the Gujaratis as immensely wealthy merchants, so a great capacity to, to fit out whole shipments of cargoes um, in their uh, single merchant to undertake uh, the, these, these, uh, the, these very expensive and, and, and risky adventures, the risks of piracy, the risk of loss, of loss at sea, uh, were very, very considerable but to bear, bear those costs and bear those risks. <clears throat> the, the various forts that were established along this sort of chain, of commercial chain through the Indian Ocean, established by the Portuguese and subsequently by the Dutch, um, uh, survives. Many of the, the Indian forts are still intact. Um, I'll show you one which is not, and this is the, uh, the Fort, uh, fort Gadia at uh, Pulikat, uh, north of Madras. Uh, this is um, when I went to Pulikat, well, I hadn't fully appreciated that across this very beautiful natural bay, which is where Madras should have been, Madras is an appalling location, um, an area infested, no natural harbour, uh, you had to offload onto ships and bounce your way into the shore, really not a very sensible place, but the Dutch got there first, and they got the Coromandel Bay, very beautiful natural harbour, um, and so directly across from Pulikat is the small town of Coromandel. Um, and the Coromandel, of course, as many of you will know, is a, uh, a corruption of Chola Mandala. It's the territory of the Cholas, uh, because they controlled all of that eastern seaboard region uh, for much of the uh, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries. 
Uh, this particular fort, um, and you see a very graphic depiction of it on a tombstone at Pulikat, one of the Dutch, um, uh, the Dutch cemetery. Um, this was lovingly torn down by the British, by the East English East <laughs> India Company, uh, demolished it stone by stone, uh, so that nothing remains of, the, of this building at all. Um, it was a symbolic demolition um, of, the, of the Dutch the Dutch presence in a way of asserting the English uh, uh, commercial supremacy. Um, the Portuguese themselves um, left their mark in terms of the textile history. There are a number of extraordinary, and I have to say rather enigmatic textiles. We don't really know where they're made. Bullycut is a very is a good contender, um, but we don't have uh, documentation or ways of verifying this. Uh, but showing not only you know, and some, some cloths, which were clearly intended for, I'd say, wealthy domestic use, essentially. They show mm, sort of at-home scene. This is a Portuguese um, uh, merchant, presumably, um, uh, with, with possibly with a local family. Um, a lot of intermarriage happening at this, at this period, much more than in later times. Um, and so we see this very delightful domestic genre uh, recorded in the current cutlery uh, from the later 16th century. Um, and other examples, this is an extraordinary fragment of a cloth. Uh, two Portuguese gentlemen, a little dalance going on with this Indian lady uh, on the left. Um, a remarkable cloth that's preserved in a Japanese historical uh, collection. We'll come back to it a little later. Um, now, Malacca itself um, has a long, long history. It really emerged um, after the demise of Sri Vijaya um, and then really found its feet um, under Chinese, um, early Ming Chinese. Uh, protection, shall we say, forming a sort of natural alliance, um, and um, consolidated its strength as a major trading entrepreneur to the China as its benefactor, essentially. Uh, and I'll show you this uh, view of, of Malacca but somewhat later from a Dutch, uh, from a Dutch source, um, which shows very clearly the a very extensive the city, and pretty much as you know it today. Um, you have the church, you have the, 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 the VOVOC factory, uh, the walls have gone, of course, they've extended the reclaimed land, uh, the bridges are still in place in modern ver versions. A uh, very extensive series of brick, brick uh, houses and then go-downs for the merchants, uh, which were usually built in, built in brick or stone as well, um, to, to, as a uh, protection against fire. Now, stepping um, back, if I may, I mean, it's, we... Uh, this trading world that um, Tomé Pérez describes um, is a remarkable one, um, and uh, as uh, I think uh, David alluded uh, uh, in the introduction, the <coughs> interconnectivity of the region is made very clear by, by Tomé Pérez's writings. Um, he makes it very clear that Cambay and its successive port, uh, Surat, in, in, uh, in Gujarat, were, were critical axial points in the international trading system that really linked the Persian Gulf Red Sea world and hence the Mediterranean uh, with um, the Indonesian world, the Malay world uh, and beyond. Uh, Perry writes, Cambay chiefly stretches out uh, her two arms. With the right arm she reaches out towards Aden and with the other towards Malacca. Malacca cannot live without Cambay, nor Cambay without Malacca. Uh, if they are to be rich and very, very prosperous. The trade of Cambay is extensive and comprises cloths of many kinds and of fair quality. And I think we can vouch for that, I think. Um, what's uh, also remarkable for, from, uh, is the archaeological evidence that's really come to, to light, um, uh, been studied more intensively in the last 15 years or so, that has a, an older history, uh, the docu first documentation of the uh, Indian textile trade to Egypt, uh, to Fostart, Old Cairo, uh, goes back to the 1930s. A French scholar, Fissa, uh, worked on this material and published a remarkably pioneering study uh, in this field, uh, which was taken up by, by others more recently. Um, and what it demonstrates very clearly is the uh, shared uh, repertoire of textiles which, which were circulating in the Indian Ocean between the Western uh, Ocean, West Asian world and, and those being traded uh, for further east. Uh, we know that most of this trade was conducted uh, by other Arab merchants or Gujarati Muslims, uh, so Red Sea merchants principally come operating out of, out of uh, uh, the Red Sea Gulf, uh, Red Sea area, Aden, uh, and so on, and then um, connecting with the uh, <coughs> compatriots in, in, in Cambay, in Gujarat, 
then doing the long distance journey uh, down the coast of Western India, stopping at various points, um, so near Cochin and other sites like this, where we find extensive uh, evidence for the use of patola, for example, in southern India, clearly a trading commodity coming out of Gujarat, a little uh, trade on the side, uh, as they do the long distance trade, um, southern Coromandel, and then across to the peninsula. So, and the Aradals we know, of course, from the evidence now of the uh, Blitung shipwreck, now, uh, you have exhibited, uh, the highlights exhibited here at the moment, um, uh, the, the, these dows were making them make part, of, part of the longest trading system uh, in human history that was taking place at this time. This is the trading system really from, from Basra, uh, the port of Baghdad, um, the home of Sinbad the sailor, all the way to the southern ports of China, to, um, to Ningbo, to Guangdong, and so Guangdong. Um, so uh, a very extensive trading system uh, and uh, high risk, high risk ventures. Um, the finds from Fostart um, make it very clear that the sort of cloths that we're showing up um, are ones we recognize from the Indonesian context. Um, some of the same dates, some um, would seem to predate the West Indian, the, the, those surviving from Indonesia. Not to say that, that some of these cloths didn't make their way east earlier, but may not have come down to us uh, uh, surviving artifacts. Those recovered from uh, Egypt have had the benefit of, of being used as funerary shrouds at some point in their history in the dry desert sands, and so their survival rates are much, much higher than, than textiles preserved in a tropical zone, as we all know very well, trying to maintain our wardrobes. Um, so here we have um, examples of cloths which are finding their way to, to Egypt. Um, uh, this uh, variegated uh, forest landscape fragment um, and we do we literally only have fragments, um, small bits of rag, um, uh, fragmentary pieces uh, which have been lovingly preserved in various museums. The Fostar material was mostly being recovered in the early 20th century and then widely dispersed across the major museums of the world uh, at that time, the 1910s, 1920s. And then we have complete versions. In the exhibition upstairs you have uh, a wonderful example of this forested landscape Typically, um, the complete cloth would have been two meters by about four and a half meters in dimension. Spectacular scale. Two cloths joined longitudinally, each roughly a meter in width, to give you the double width, that being the loom, the loom width, the width of over a meter. Uh, really quite spectacular. Also cloths which defy wearing. I mean, these, really, these are heavy, large uh, items. These are not clearly not items of dress. Uh, they're, they're intended for some other function. And this is, again, one of the questions that are being looked at, we looked at today, how these cloths functioned, um, how they were appropriated and redefined, if you like, by the host, host cultures that received them, uh, what, what sets of meanings they acquired, um, uh, how they were acculturated uh, when, in, in their final destinations. The other uh, spectacular uh, motif and a very recurring one is the uh, sacred goose, which is a very ancient motif. Uh, it has a specific Buddhist meaning, but it's a broad, a generic ancient Indian um, motif. Uh, the hamsa, um, which appears in the textile repertoire um, from around this, the 13th, 14th century. We have fragments again from Fostar, and then large-scale complete examples uh, from Indonesia. So many with merchants' marks, and some some with um, uh, chops from uh, uh, merchants and enterprises from Cambay and elsewhere. Some of these motifs have an afterlife, uh, continue on into a, uh, again a, a very interesting variation on the Hamsa motif, central a central or flower-like configuration with the bird forms uh, radiating uh, out from that. The cloths, as I say, are spectacular. This is a, a complete uh, example of one cloth, but as you can see, the design, it has a complete border on the lower margin, but not on the upper. It was intended to be a mirror a version of it would, would have completed the composition, double the height, really quite spectacular. And a uh, combination of a very um, basic color range, essentially uh, uh, iron black, um, indigo blue, and, and uh, um, a mordant, probably chai uh, mordant, um, three essential um, components. Uh, no, no real uh, uh, evidence um, of, of, of multiple dyeing at this at this stage uh, to produce uh, variant colours. Uh, this is one of the most uh, beautiful examples from the Shah collection in um, in Mumbai. Uh, fragmentary, but very very beautiful 
uh, example, one of these uh, uh, landscape textile cloths. Uh, the individual motifs, the treatment of the various trees and so on, um, can be related to dated manuscript paintings uh, from, from, from uh, principally from Gujarat. Uh, I show on the left-hand screen a, a, a Jane a Yantra, a, a sacred diagram, a cloth painting uh, dated 1451 in the V&A, and you can see the treatment of trees here uh, is clearly analogous to those which appear um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the painted textile. Now, uh, Tommy Perez uh, told us that there are up to 30 varieties of, of uh, Gujarati cloth were being traded in Malacca uh, during his time there. Uh, uh, he did admit some sort of inventory, not descriptive. Uh, we have no sense of what they looked like. Um, and it's really only now with the, the new archaeology and so on that we're beginning to get to actually to dress the record, if you like, to actually have a, a visual sense of what these cloths looked like um, uh, in uh, that are referred to in the records. And the same issue applies um, not only in the 15th, 14th, 15th century, but also in the 16th and 17th century. And I'll get to that time permitting um, shortly. Uh, we have, uh, again, another, actually also dated 1451, uh, this very beautiful um, uh, cloth, cloth, vertical pata, uh, narrative cloth painting celebrating the joys of spring. Um, uh, and the sort of sexual liberation of spring, actually, um, <laughs> largely about love narratives taking place in, in these paintings. A very important painting in the Priya Sakla Gallery. Um, and um, again, you'll see the treatment of, of, of the tree motifs and so on. This clearly belong to a shared uh, visual vocabulary. Uh, one of the, the earliest cloths we, we know is on the left hand screen. This is a, a fragment from the Ashmolean Museum. You can see the, the rear end of an elephant here. Um, and, and, and the question <coughs> figures here, um, ready carbon dated to 10th, uh, 10th, early 11th century. This is uh, the earliest sort of uh, reliable dates that we have. When we'll get come later on to the whole issue of ready carbon dating. It's a complex, complex one, um, but, but uh, it's largely built. The, the reconstruction that we can make of the history of the textile trade is. Is, is, is not based on, on, on single cloth dating, but on a whole uh, corpus of material um, which correlates and, and reinforces. So we have a very strong sense of the uh, of, of, of radiocarbon dates for the which cluster in the 14th and 15th century, which gives us a real sense of, of, of the time frame in which many of these cloths belong. With this technique, the further back in time you go, the more reliable the reading. And the reverse is also true, of course. Uh, one of the more spectacular uh, motifs is Raja um, uh, on a hunting expedition, a uh, very, very uh, wonderful um, the outline designs, usually in, 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 in the wall, in the uh, iron, um, and then with very summarily painted um, indigo uh, infill painting. A rather rough and ready, one has to say. And um, uh, hunting scenes, the battle battle scene in this case, very lively. In terms of analogies, uh, illustrated palm leaves. This is from a banda from a giant um, library in Patan. Um, and um, you can see that the whole general treatment of, of, of the figures in elephants are okay, okay, very analogous to those in the paintings. Then we have a whole series of figurative cloths, really quite spectacular, the same scale as the landscapes, uh, with these very beautiful um, uh, courtesan type figures. Uh, we don't have no real um, notion of. of, of of um, what they're intended to represent. And I've suggested elsewhere that these may be uh, depictions of uh, the uh, celestial ladies of Indra's heaven, uh, the abode of, abode of, uh, of the gods. Uh, that's uh, one um, which would fit in a Jain context, is one suggestion. Uh, a very beautiful group of figures. Again, very explicit and differentiated uh, treatment of, of, of costume. Um, each one is very stylish. Um, and notice the lady carrying this little uh, uh, rose water dispenser here. Um, a little motif that we uh, um, uh, is important to show the, the, the use of the, the type of fan that's being used. Um, and much kit to, to, to go and do your practice your craft in another place. 
And we know the VOC were very active in encouraging craftsmen and tradesmen to move um, to set up new production centres. We know the, uh, the, the VOC in, in, in Sri Lanka, for example, attempted to set up a, a, a range to uh, bring Tamil workers um, from southern India to Jaffna to set up a, a textile production centres there unsuccessfully, but the temp is recorded in the VOC records, for example. Uh, the textile uh, depicting the, these uh, celestial maidens, if that's what they are, uh, are really very spectacular. Um, <coughs> almost certainly must have had an existence, parallel existence in India. My theory is that they, the reality is something produced out of a, a Jain cultural milieu, um, and that these uh, would have had a place in Jain temples, hung during Jain festivals, um, and it begs the question, why aren't they preserved in the Jain treasuries, because the Jains, more than anybody else, more than the Buddhists or the Hindus, preserve their, 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 leg of their religious legacy in terms of their manuscripts and their artwork. They have a special place set aside in the Jain temple, which is the Bandha, uh, where these items would be preserved. So, and manuscripts survive, but textiles have not come down to us. So this remains um, a question. As you can see, some of the details are exceedingly beautiful. Um, very schematic in their painting, of course, these curious uh, eye conventions that it's recorded profile with projecting eye, uh, something coming straight out of the, the painting tradition uh, of, of Western India, predominantly Hindu, uh, a Jain tradition, but also uh, practiced. Uh, uh, we also have uh, uh, Hindu examples as well, particularly text devoted to the celebration of Krishna. And just a reminder, uh, a later uh, 1500s painting. Um, but again, you can see the analogy uh, with the stylization of the, the human figure. It's a very, very direct uh, analogy. Now, I'm a little conscious of time. So let me just, um, I just wanted to um, uh, finish this section by, by looking at this uh, very spectacular um, uh, depiction of, of, of these um, celebratory ladies in landscape. Um, and then introduce um, a textile which I, I recently uh, published from the Shah Collection, an extraordinary um, uh, kalankari uh, which uh, appears to be celebrating the Spring Festival. Um, I think it's probably from Southern Andhra, uh, the Deccan somewhere. Um, it belongs to a, a late Vijayanagara, early Nayaka cultural world. Um, uh, we have a figure looking, uh, the Dark Lord, I mean, this is Krishna. Um, the blue figure, no, I think it's probably the ruler, in fact, enjoying himself with the ladies of the court um, in the spring festival. And they're spraying the, the syringes, the sort of erotic you know, spraying of the sy syringes uh, as a fertility of celebration. We see these big syringes in these great basins here and being <coughs> intoxicating uh, uh, beverages from, from flasks and so on. This is a, a rather wild. Um, scene. Um, I think it's play acting essentially. It's not the god, it's the ruler representing himself as the god, as Krishna. An extraordinary, uh, extraordinary textile, but one which um, fits into the broader um, world of the Kalankaras that we know from the trade context. And if you look at the treatment of the borders uh, and the end panels, again, these are very familiar from the trade, trade context. A remarkable cloth. Uh, unique as far as we know, um, though I've heard rumour of another fragmentary version of it in existence. Um, and it, the punchline, yes, it was actually found in Sulawesi. Um, quite, quite extraordinary um, and um, a, a, a absolutely a remarkable uh, example of a trade textile. Now, I want to move uh, uh, forward um, to look at the 16th and 17th centuries in the time I have remaining, um, and two sets of evidence um, which help us to address that period. Again, we have extensive sources, I mean, many, many more sources for the, for the period when the European trading, record, trading company records kick in, um, uh, the, the English and the, and the Dutch and, uh, and so on. Uh, very extensive references to textiles, but again, the descriptions are uh, uh, elusive, uh, they, they're not specific enough. John Irwin, uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, struggled with trying to link, to form a correlation between these name lists of textiles and the actual cloths themselves. And there are so many 
Uh, the, the links are tenuous at best in most cases. Uh, for the majority of cases, we don't know. But the visual evidence um, starts to help us um, compensate uh, just a little for that. Um, and so I want to introduce uh, two sets of, of, of evidence, one of which I, 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 I touched on very briefly at Woven Cargos a decade ago. Um, and these are a series of paintings uh, produced in Lisbon for the, for the Jesuits at the Church of Sao Roque. Um, <coughs> paintings commissioned by um, the Jesuits from a local painter, uh, Renilso, uh, someone who we know never traveled east, never went to Goa or any of that. He was a stay-at-home boy. He was spent all his career in Lisbon. Um, and in 1619, he was commissioned to produce 24 paintings celebrating the miraculous activities of Francis Xavier, his, work, his activities in southern India, in Sri Lanka, in the Malaccas, in Japan, uh, all his missionary, missionary work and the great events. Um, and these remarkable paintings, which are not so large, they're very skilled, competent paintings without being great works of art in a small chapel of the main um, uh, sanctuary of the church. Um, but what they provide is, I think, the most detailed and revealing inventory of Indian textiles of the early 17th century. Here we have um, the resurrection of uh, the clan leader. Um, and just to take you through some of the textiles, uh, behind us, Marie, uh, Mother Teresa type figure, you have a lady here with the red um, floral motif, meanders on a white ground. Um, we have this, this uh, man here wearing his. Um, Lungi, again, a, a, a modern dyed um, <coughs> chai um, design, uh, another variant of that here, another with a combination of, of blue and red uh, represented here. And just to show you some of the details, we have direct analogies for many of these cloths in the Southeast Asian trade context. Um, uh, they're not perfect analogies, but, but in many cases they're, I think, quite revealing and, and I think, compelling. Um, so you make your, I don't need to elaborate, the visual evidence is there uh, before you. Uh, this uh, radiating star motif and so on, very, very clearly uh, related. Uh, this figure wearing a uh, cloth which has both red and blue in, in, its, in its designs, in this long sari leg here. Uh, the cripple um, with, again, the, the step patterns. Um, and re most remarkably, uh, this pair of seated ladies in the, one in the foreground with this quatrefoil red and blue pattern, um, identical really, um, to a cloth recovered from South Sumatra. Um, so I mean, these are, uh, the analogies are so strong and so direct um, that we have, I think, very clear uh, datable evidence um, in the first quarter of the 17th uh, century um, for uh, many of these cloths which otherwise float in an amorphous period somewhere between the 17th and mid 18th century. We, how do we date these things? Um, so th this set of paintings uh, become very, very important in telling, in telling the story, I think. And this is the, I think has to be the way forward where we don't have, uh, the scientific methods will not help us in this later period. Um, and we have very little, um, the te textual sources are too schematic, uh, lacking in detail. It goes on. Here. Yeah. Now, and my second uh, piece of evidence um, is, is dateable but not dated, except the distinction. Um, it's a series of mural paintings in Tamil Nadu in, in the um, Tanjore district, a uh, small village um, not far from Nagapatnam on the Kaveri River system. Um, and in the Gopuram of this uh, temple uh, are a series of paintings commissioned by the local ruling uh, elite. They're a Vijayanagar, um, extended Vijayanagar royal family, Nayakas. Uh, who moved south and established their independent uh, fiefdoms uh, in, the, in, the, in the very rich um, Tanjore regions of uh, southern India. And these remarkable paintings uh, would decorate the gateway to the temple, the Gopura, um, uh, depict a whole range of, of mercantile activities, clearly an indication of the, the uh, activity of that uh, family, uh, immensely wealthy, and this scene which I absolutely love, which shows uh, gem traders, uh, their precious stones, um, arranged here um, and uh, holding up, obviously, a, a real um, cracker of a big, beautiful gemstone, <laughs> much admired, um, and the little cloth bags in which the stones will be kept, and so on. So, um, and if you like, sitting on the spread cloth, doing, doing their business. That's a wonder, wonderful painting. Um, in the same um, series of the paintings, 
we have a depiction of Narabdal, a remarkable uh, uh, painting, um, and uh, the, only, the only visual evidence we have for what's described extensively in the Portuguese uh, sources particularly, which is the Arab, the West Asian horse trade uh, to the Deccan. Very, very important. Uh, the um, Vijanaga uh, army, the kingdom's army, was largely cavalry. Um, the horses were very, very important for the strategically, um, and most of those horses were coming from West Asia. A very, very important uh, trade. Um, and we see the horses all lined up here very happily, uh, having made their journey from, from the Arabian Peninsula um, and, um, and then being um, uh, marched off uh, on the jetty. It's a very lovely, lovely painting. So this gives us a real uh, sense of the commercial life of the region. Most of that trade was going to the west coast. This looks as though these ships were coming uh, probably in on the east coast um, through Nagapatnam. Nagapatnam was a, a, really the, the official port of the, um, of the trawlers and remained at a very important uh, port right through into relatively modern, modern, modern times. So this series, of, this series of paintings, which we can date to the very uh, close of the 16th, to maybe early 17th century, uh, are a very important sort of document in terms of uh, the commercial life of the region. <coughs> now, I just want to take you, because my time now is short, um, <laughs> through, um, uh, this is just a, a glimpse of the global reach of some of this trade. We have the Dutch uh, engaging with the Sri Lankans um, uh, in Kandy uh, in, in the 16th century, um, Spielberg uh, here uh, with the uh, King, King Surya uh, uh, of Kandy. Uh, we have um, this remarkable painting of uh, the Dutch Reform Minister who lived in Jaffna for many years um, and undertook the study of the whole southern Coromandel coast and Sri Lanka and published a remarkable work uh, in the 1670s, Baldius, um, and his Tamil um, pundit, could uh, be a very learned man, um, who has his uh, stylus. In his, in his lungi here, this is for writing on the palm leaf manuscript. So we know he's a man of a man of learning, um, and uh, shown uh, kindred spirits, shall we say? Um, the Dutch factories were much more elaborate than the Portuguese ones. This is Hooghly, This is uh, Calcutta um, in the 17th century. A remarkable painting now in the in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. And there's shipbuilding activity going on. You see all the range of activities that are happening here. Uh, for fortified trading settlements, essentially. A close-up of Malacca um, uh, in the 17th century. Um, and we know that the Dutch were very particular about controlling um, the trade, and they attempted to impose a monopoly, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Lahoven will talk much more about this, um, uh, but particularly the use of Patola, which seems to have been highly restricted. Uh, certainly the Dutch attempted to maintain a monopoly on it, probably unsuccessfully, uh, but to use them as grace and favor gifts to local rulers to get trading concessions and so on. Uh, Bantam, uh, the great early port in West Java, uh, predecessor to Batavia, uh, effectively closed down by the Dutch, they could establish a strong monopoly in, in, in Batavia, a uh, very important center. And we know with um, John Lancaster, who captained the first British East India Company ship in 1602 to Southeast Asia, um, succeeded in um, capturing a Portuguese carrack fully loaded with, uh, with textiles, uh, which he very successfully then traded in for pepper uh, in Bantam. So uh, piracy was rife. Uh, a painting of the cosmopolitan nature of Batavia uh, in the late, late 17th century, a painting by Beckmans. Um, and those of you that know, know the region, this is the Chudawan River leading down to Tanjung Priok. Um, uh, here is the, um, the VOC Director General's residence. Uh, the, still, the State House is still there, of course. As many of you know, the walls have gone. Um, um, here are the, the trading, trading areas and, and gallows. So, and this very international community, uh, many of whom were of mixed, mixed descent by this time, intermarriage taking place very widely uh, between uh, 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 Europeans and, and, and a whole range of, of, of people from the region. Remarkable uh, document, if you like. Um, the hall for the sale of stuffs and cloths. Um, uh, we, probably for the sale of seconds. This was where you got rid of the, the shop soiled goods that didn't um, got damaged in transit or whatever. Um, um, stalls run mainly by Chinese merchants. And that, I think, uh, judging by the, uh, was probably located around here. Um, you get a view 
uh, it's probably, uh, the state house be, be beyond. Um, so I, I think it's probably in this area uh, at some at some point in its history. Um, as I mentioned, that you have the, the cosmopolitan uh, world of, of intermarriage taking place. People wearing European style uh, chintzes, for example. This little cameo, probably dating. Any way to really date it is the furniture, actually, uh, around 1760s, I'm told, by um, uh, furniture specialists. Um, and then uh, the whole trade um, interest was expressed in the trade to Japan. Um, I show uh, this very famous uh, Sarasa Benin. This was a book produced in Japan in the late 18th century, which documented all the types of Indian, exotic Indian plots coming into Japan, um, which could then be uh, copied. Um, and there's a whole industry of copying, making locally produced imitations of the imports. Um, and um, it's, it's all color coded. The, the instructions are there for what color should go in which place. Uh, and here we have a depiction of a, of a, a Brahmin Rishi, a holy man, which is rather exotic. Um, and this extraordinary, uh, speaking of exotic, uh, fragment uh, was showing these grotesque creatures, uh, lions and so on, Gacha Simha, uh, uh, very, very extraordinary uh, rendering. Uh, it's just by a southern Indian uh, Kalankari painter, uh, their understanding of East Asian imagery. A remarkable fragment that it's very lucky to acquire for the, for the Met quite recently. Um, and just some analogies from the um, <coughs> remarkable cloth recovered from Indonesia, which again has this treatment of grotesques uh, as a very central uh, uh, motif. Uh, more typically for Japanese market, of course, are, are those showing uh, crest-like uh, motifs, um, uh, very, very beautiful, more to Japanese taste. Um, and these find their way into tea ceremony, of course, uh, into the mount, uh, scroll uh, mounts for um, hang hanging scrolls and so on. Uh, you see this Kamankari fragment we saw uh, earlier. Um, European uh, market designs, um, not, I think, destined for Europe, I think destined for the expatriate community within Southeast Asia, for Sri Lanka or indeed for Batavia or Malacca. These were large, long-term uh, communities who also expressed an interest in living a European lifestyle, emulating metropolitan taste uh, in Batavia. And so this is a bizarre stilk type pattern. Um, we can date this to, uh, fairly precisely to the, probably the second quarter of the 18th century. Um, and I want to show you a remarkable textile, um, uh, very extraordinary uh, uh, produced uh, in clearly a European design uh, with this strap work and bracketed uh, motifs. Uh, a very large um, uh, section of, of, of coromandel chintz, unquestionably, um, uh, clearly inspired by uh, Huguenot Flemish Dutch um, designs of, of the, the uh, late 17th, early 18th century, which was springing really out of Versailles and the French aesthetic. Uh, um, these appear in interior designs, in uh, rich merchants' homes, in, in uh, garden, the plans of gardens, and so on, inspired by Versailles and so on. Uh, these sort of motifs are very, very important in the northern European design in that period. It finds its way somehow pattern book perhaps, being uh, emulated in the Coromandel Coast. Um, then was maybe it was quilted at some point, um, and it, it remains quilted, um, so it functions a bed cover or something like this. Um, where? It's European workmanship, it's not done in India, it's not done in, elsewhere in East Asia, although the backing is Chinese silk, so probably done in Batavia would be a, a reasonable guess, um, sourced in Japan. So it found it so that we have European design with a life in Southeast Asia and ultimate destination associated with tea ceremony in Japan. A remarkable sort of, sort of inter interconnected globe uh, type story. Uh, very, very beautiful. Here are two more details uh, of this very remarkable uh, textile. Um, so uh, just a little treat. Just, this is something which has just, just surfaced. And I just wanted to conclude, because I hope you indulged me with too much time, um, with this uh, textile, which you have an example in the exhibition. Um, these are remarkable, uh, these are very rare category of cloth, um, which really serve as a sort of inventory of the trade textile story. Um, these are patchwork designs, they have a particular uh, place in, in Javanese culture particularly, talisman, they made patchwork garments are made up as a, they have a talismanic function. Um, but this was emulated in the trade cloth story as well. Uh, this is a patchwork, this is a painting depicting patchwork. 
um, in which we see a, the whole repertoire of, of tra trade designs, um, which of course then had a whole afterlife, if you like, in the, the later story of, of Batik and so on in the history of Southeast Asia. Thank you.